Welcome back. Last episode, we discussed the origins of the Providence Island experiment and its ideological foundations, and we ended with the departure of the Sea Flower, which carried the first official group of colonists from England to their new home. An advance party was already there, building the settlement under the leadership of Governor Philip Bell, who had jumped at the opportunity to leave the ungodly colony of Bermuda and found one based on Puritan ideals. You're listening to the American History Podcast with Sarah Tungsalvola, the show exploring who we are and why by tracing American history from the 17th century to the 20th. So, the Sea Flower set sail from Plymouth Harbor in February of 1631. It was a 10 week trip and predictably terrible. The man who the company had hired to stock the ship with food and supplies had cheated them, buying the worst goods he could find and billing the company the full amount. And on the way, the Sea Flower's captain, John Tanner cut everyone's rations by a third, hoarding the excess to sell to the settlers once they'd reached their destination. Par for the 17th century course. Power corrupts, and at sea in the 17th century, the ship's crew had absolute power. They lived a rough, hard life anyway, and as people in every single colony had learned, they didn't often extend their benevolence to naive strangers. When the colonists arrived, though, they got to work building their little settlement. Bell got a ceremonial seal and plate, as well as a series of letters, both public and private, with detailed instructions as to how he was to run the colony. The company had complete, total, and utter control, and Bell was to inform them about everything that went on so that they could make good decisions. Each family built their own house out of all the best mud on the island, and immediately after that, they were ordered to continue work on the forts, three in total, under the supervision of Captain Samuel Axe an experienced privateer and fortifications expert who had cut his teeth during the Dutch Wars of Independence. And they would receive military training, at least once a month, led by Captain William Rudyard. They were, after all, at the mouth of the Spanish Empire. And then, they were ordered to grow enough food to be self-sufficient. Only after they'd grown enough food would the company consider sending more settlers and servants to help with the work. Beyond food, they were also ordered to experiment with commodity crops. Bell would assign experimental crops to each family and inform the company about which ones they were growing. Growing exotic plants would have the double benefit of supporting the company and reducing England's dependence on Catholic countries like Spain and Portugal for luxuries like silk, wine, and ginger. And Axe had brought all the finest scientific books in England to maximize the chance of crop success. And back in England, the company was looking for profitable commodities. They had friends in other colonies and trading companies like the East India Company, and it wasn't long before their dock was full of samples of exotic seeds, shoots, and plants. Some were foods, some were medicines, and plenty were used to dye cloth. But after one transatlantic voyage, the company was already in debt. In addition to paying the ship's crew four pounds per passenger, 
the company had hired the ship at a rate of 130 pounds per month. It was supposed to be gone for 9 to 10 months, but ended up being gone for over a year. There were only 20 people paying the entirety of this cost, which now came out to about 1,700 pounds. And some of the investors were reluctant to actually give the company the money they owed. To make up the difference, John Pym borrowed money at interest. But like so many before them, the Providence Island Company remained optimistic that this would be a one-time investment, and that soon the colony would be self-supporting and sending back precious commodities. And to fuel their optimism, three months before the sea flower returned to England, but a month after they'd expected it to, the company received letters on a different ship sent via Bermuda, in which the colonists expressed their own optimism. This island is amazing. It can grow anything. Precious things are already growing wild. We've already planted a ton of different types of fruit. This will grow into one of the great gardens of the world. The growing season was long enough that they could plant two to three crops of corn per year, and because the advance party had already done that, there was already tons of food before the sea flower had arrived. And that food was the best on earth. The island was beautiful, the air was fragrant, and filled with the songs of birds. This was the Eden of God, and the settlers had found all things to their heart's desire. And, they said, the colony was doing well on the religious front. Bell was a wonderful governor. He was serious, religious, and eloquent, and his deeds showed him to be all a Christian. And he knew a lot about planting tobacco, which could keep the colony going until everything else matured. And, you know... The tobacco which grew on Providence Island was good enough to rival even the best Spanish tobacco. I mean, how many times have we heard this story? Or rather, how many times have we heard a different story as a colony started? There was always a good deal of genuine optimism, but the colonists also relied on the money that the investors put into the project, so they played up their optimism to encourage more generous investments. They didn't talk about the dissatisfaction and conflict which had already started to emerge. The only negative they noted was that drought conditions had reduced the corn crop. But Providence Island hadn't suffered from the high initial death rate that most colonies had endured. The buildings went up faster, the climate was nicer, the food was more plentiful, and there was nothing resembling a seasoning sickness. And the extreme optimism had its desired effect. Before the sea flower even returned, the investors had decided that they would send an even bigger ship. They had already put more money than they'd expected to in the colony, but you've got to spend money to make money. This time, they planned to recruit 150 colonists, as well as a magazine of supplies big enough to support all the settlers, old and new alike. So they hired the charity. Throughout this time, Pym was absolutely steadfast, urging the investors to pay more and worry less. And finally, the sea flower did return. Captain Tanner explained that the Spanish Coast Guard had attacked him off the coast of Florida at the end of December, and that in the attack he'd lost an eye, as well as many of his crew. That was why he'd been delayed, but he'd brought a new bundle of letters from the colonists, as well as the products that the colonists had sent back. 
But this bundle of letters wasn't quite as glowingly positive. For one, they told the company about Tanner's behavior en route to the island and the poor quality stuff that they'd been sent. And in response to this, the colony decided to buy its own supplies in the future to avoid being cheated. They considered firing Tanner, but they decided not to do this because he had successfully fought the Spanish and he'd managed to protect the company's property. More disappointingly, though, the settlers hadn't sent back huge quantities of precious commodities. They just sent back a couple of bags of poor quality tobacco and a letter explaining why. First, the late summer heat had killed a lot of their plants, and late autumn had brought storms which killed even more. But more importantly, the colony was on the verge of mutiny. By this point in time, and by this point in time, I mean after two small batches of colonists had moved to Providence Island, the colony's society was a hodgepodge of different people with different ideas, motivations, and backgrounds. The investors may have dreamed of an ideologically pure colony, but at the end of the day, survival in 17th century America depended on bringing in the people who had the skills their colony needed, period. Providence Island had tried to minimize this, but it couldn't eliminate it entirely. The first group was the servants. These were mainly teenagers, and mainly people who had relocated unwillingly, to put it nicely. Yes, they had the promise of freedom after three years, but unlike most colonies, after their term was up, they wouldn't be given land because no one owned land in Providence Island. They faced beating from their fathers and were forced to conform with Puritan society, even though most of them didn't hold Puritan ideals. And for them, and everyone who worked the land, Providence Island's long growing season had a very tangible downside. In temperate climates, and even in Bermuda and Virginia, agricultural workers worked very hard during the planting and harvesting seasons, but other than that, they had a lot of leisure time. All of their work was concentrated into a couple months a year, and the rest was pretty much light maintenance duties. In the tropics, the growing season lasted for the majority of the year, and there could be three planting and harvesting seasons, plus continual attempts to cultivate new crops. And on top of that, they had to build all of the public buildings and fortifications and undergo regular military training. There was no leisure time, but there was also no increased reward for the increased work. They didn't get the type of security that they would have gotten in England. They didn't have any hope of getting land the way they would have in any other colony, and there wasn't anything to buy even if they'd been paid. They couldn't even relax at the pub at the end of the day, and because of the colony's Puritan roots, they weren't allowed to engage in even the free forms of recreation, like sports or cards. All they were doing was following the orders of people who weren't much higher class than they were, with those people governed by an authority half a world away. The second group of people were the Puritans who led the families and ran the farms. It wasn't too long before this group of people discovered that the company's magazine was playing favorites. 
most of these people had traveled to Providence Island under the patronage of individual investors in London. And some of those investors had a lot more power and money than others. So, at the magazine, some people got virtually nothing or even had their goods confiscated, while others got as much as they needed. To make matters worse, there were actually Dutch ships regularly passing by who offered to sell them supplies at better prices. But even the people who were being cheated worst by the magazine had to turn down the offer. They also faced all the problems of increased work with decreased compensation, and they were reminded of the Spanish threat, but they still resented the imposition. And perhaps most of all, there was a deep sense among these people that the system of land distribution was unfair. Not only did they not get permanent ownership of the land, they also had to give the company half of everything they grew, plus pay a corrupt magazine for supplies that they could buy more cheaply elsewhere, plus give their time to build a public works and take care of public officials. So, for the privilege of being on this little island, they had to work harder than they'd ever worked in their lives, ultimately give everything back to the company, and be treated unfairly by the company. Finally, the third group of people who colonized the island were the military-type people. These people may have been Puritan, but they were Puritan in a fiery, brash, and oftentimes cruel way that was reminiscent of people like John Endicott, who shared a very similar background. These were predominantly ship's captains with dreams of privateering, and whether or not the company wanted them, their presence was an undeniable necessity. Never since the earliest days of Jamestown, had a colony been so brazenly encroaching on Spanish territory, or so likely to provoke an attack. Under the circumstances, conflict was inevitable. The company actually got a hint of the colonists' disgruntlement at the land situation, but they brushed it off and simply said that all the colonies had used a similar system. And, they said, soon they'd all be so rich that no one would care. Now, the full story is that all the colonies had started with a similar system, but no colony except Providence Island was still using it by 1631, because in each colony, that system, known as tenancy at halves, had led to severe economic failure. Every colony had had to turn to a system of private land ownership, and the quicker they did that, the faster their economic recovery. But the Providence Island Company ignored that history and maintained its position that total control from London was necessary to preserve an ideologically pure, godly colony, and that need for control meant that the land needed to be their property. But there's no such thing as ideological purity. Differences will always arise, and it was a difference of opinion on proper Puritan practice that set off the powder keg that was Providence Island society. Specifically, it was a difference of opinion between William Rudyard and the colony's minister, Lewis Morgan. Morgan was 22 years old, enthusiastic, Oxford-educated, and devoted. He was certainly young, but older ministers had wives and children, and the company wasn't allowing families to go to the colony yet. <laughs> 
so they were pretty much inevitably going to be stuck with somebody who was much younger, at least early on. He led the colony in prayers twice a day, and at the end of the evening prayers, he liked to lead his congregation in the singing of psalms. But singing psalms was a controversial practice. People who supported it said that they were a godly alternative to raunchy ballads and folk songs. But others argued that singing psalms had never been a part of traditional church services, so they were sort of a contrived practice. And Captain Rudyard was in that camp. Rudyard was the younger brother of Benjamin Rudyard, who was one of the London investors, and he was a cousin of the Earl of Warwick, plus he was the colony's military leader. So Rudyard criticized Morgan, and Morgan returned the insult, calling Rudyard's remarks sacrilegious. And soon the fight went beyond psalms. Rudyard was older, respected, higher class, and used to military-style authority. On the basis of any one of those things, he felt that Morgan should back down and submit to his higher status. But Morgan stood his ground. And then Morgan voiced lots of criticisms of Rudyard that the other colonists hadn't previously been able to. The colonists split into factions, supporting either Rudyard or Morgan, with the military largely on the captain's side and everyone else behind the minister. As revolt loomed, Morgan wrote to London, telling the company that Rudyard was frequently drunk, abused his power over the settlers, and caused constant conflict. He said the company hadn't laid the foundations for a community of devout believers, and then, after listing the settlers' grievances, he accused the company of being primarily motivated by greed, and said that the investors were putting on a hypocritical show of godliness for the encompassing of ungodly ends. And that was the main letter that came on the sea flower. Other private letters complained to individual investors, evidently with even harsher accusations about the company, and concerns about the military presence on the island. They were particularly worried about Elfrith's increasingly reckless behavior, and in fact, one of the leaders of Morgan's faction, a man named John Essex, had boarded the Seaflower personally so that he could voice the colonists' complaints in person. He may have even been planning to publish some of the letters, but he'd been killed in the Spanish attack. The company wasn't happy, and Morgan took the bulk of the blame. They may have outfitted him lavishly and allowed him to live in the governor's mansion, but at the end of the day, he was little more than a middle-class kid who was filling the role of minister until the colony stabilized and they could send someone more experienced. He was not supposed to be leading revolts. So the company ordered Bell to return Morgan to London, but they told him not to tell Morgan about the plan until the charity was getting ready to leave the island. They also sent a public letter aboard the charity, accusing the colonists of being no better than the Israelites, who were not satisfied with the promise of that good land which God had provided them. They pointed out their own enormous expenses, which already came out to over 600 pounds per person. They told the colonists that their peers would call them fools for investing so much, 
but they said that they and the colonists alike had been given a great opportunity to serve their nation and their religion, and that neither group should take the mission lightly. And, they said, a lot of the blame for the problems lay with the settlers, who hadn't adequately experimented with commodities or even planted a large quantity of tobacco. And they pointed out that the settlers knew the terms before they went, and that they had had nothing before. So why were they complaining exactly? And it was with this attitude that they went through each one of the complaints voiced in the colonists' letters. And for the time being, they left it at that. Essex had been killed and Morgan would be sent back, so maybe the situation would dissipate. They forgave the other ringleaders, like Edward Gates, and sent some seeds of potential commodities, like mulberry trees, rhubarb roots, and cotton, pomegranate, and pepper, which would be picked up on the way to Providence Island. And there were a few concessions and promises, including the potential of sending women, eliminating the family structure, and organizing some lifelong leases. They also sent more instructions for the colonists, telling the colonists to plant some sugar for their own personal use, even if the island wasn't fit for large-scale plantations. The new instructions included specific guidelines for Elfrith in response to colonists' increasing concerns, explicitly ordering him not to provoke any hostile confrontations unless he had specific instructions from London. If the island was attacked, he could defend it, and that was it. And they reiterated that Elfrith would be subservient to Bell and the council. And they decided to send away some of the less godly people, most of whom had come from Bermuda. Though the military presence would still remain. And they would lock up the liquor and have the authorities distribute it, with the exception of private stores owned by people who had demonstrated their temperance. And they ordered that any cards, tables, and dice that colonists had privately requested be burned on arrival. If colonists wanted recreation, they could play chess or go shooting, and that was it. And they were still forbidden from trading with other countries' ships. So yet again... A fledgling colony had fallen into internal chaos, and yet again the colonists and investors had turned against each other, and yet again they were flinging the same old insults at each other across the Atlantic. Lazy, greedy, ungrateful, corrupt. It's a pattern we've seen over and over again at this point. And that is to be expected. This was an extremely high-stakes, high-stress situation for both sides, but especially for the colonists. If you've ever taken a vacation with somebody or done a group project, you know how quickly things can get heated and how fast people, even those who normally get along, can turn on each other. And that's not even something where death or financial ruin are likely outcomes. And this was exacerbated by another development that occurred in all the colonies except the ones in New England. The power structures, which had always ordered traditional English society, were gone. Entire congregations would move to New England, and yet they still dealt with their fair share of faction fighting. But in Virginia, in Bermuda, and to a slightly lesser extent in Maryland, but also in the Caribbean colonies, 
people went individually. And they went individually to a place that didn't have a pre-existing government or power structure, where ultimate authority was weeks away and where life and death depended on making the right decision regardless of what class you were. Most higher ranking people had come with some expectation of being treated better, but it was never long before the middle and lower classes started to question that. There simply wasn't anything in it for them. The other people hadn't earned their respect, and there was no one who could compel them to behave differently. I'm not going to say that the middle and lower classes necessarily worked harder, because plenty of people in England at the time were lamenting how lazy workers were getting and actually trying to figure out why that was the case, but regardless of how hard they worked, there was no benefit to simply submitting to people because they may have been their social superiors in England. And with both colonists and investors struggling and relying on things that the other just wasn't providing as fast as they needed it, the transatlantic name-calling was equally inevitable. Were the accusations true? Were investors really driven by pure greed, and were colonists really so lazy that they'd rather fail or even die than work? Well, whether you believe them is for you to decide. And more relevantly, the question is, why did Providence Island fail to overcome these problems, where places like Jamestown and Plymouth succeeded? And there's really one major tangible difference that we've seen so far, because the other colonies were slow to privatize land. That is the determination of the company to keep total power in England, to avoid the creation of government structures within the colony, and requiring that even the most minor run-of-the-mill decisions go through the company in England. You could argue that that was kind of sort of the case in Maryland's earliest years, but certainly not in the same way, and every other colony allowed settlers to at least run their day-to-day -day affairs without supervision. And, they didn't strictly regulate settlers' recreation either. But was that enough to tip the scales from endurance to failure? We'll continue to think about that, but next week we'll see the escalation of all these problems and the creation of a couple more. Thanks for listening. If you have any opinions, thoughts, or theories about anything we've discussed in the show, I'd love to hear from you either on Facebook or Twitter, and you can find those links at the website AmericanHistoryPodcast.net, as well as links to first-hand accounts and things. See you next week!